The NAP Connection features a panel from the Lehigh Valley and the Brooks area discussing selected art issues and procedures with a knowledgeable guest. The program moderator is James Carroll. During the live panel discussion, the home viewer has the opportunity to call the station and offer their views and concerns for inclusion in the discussion. The NAP Connection is brought to you by the New Arts Program, a nonprofit arts service organization in cooperation with the Berks Community Television. The NAP Connection is supported in part by the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, local government, area businesses, NAP memberships, and individual contributions. Good evening, I'd like to welcome you. I'm James Carroll, and this evening we are going to be sharing with you a lot of information, and uh, during the course of the evening, uh, do share and uh, take time. And uh, the biggest part of the evening uh, will be presented with information and her insight, and that is Janet uh, Roberts. She is a poet, and she will be introducing you to the topic this evening. And uh, I can't think of anything else other than uh, let's start off, Janet. Okay. Um, we are celebrating United Nations Day, and along with that occasion, um, we've been hearing much about Moscow and Russia. And this evening, we are celebrating the sculpture and sculptor um, who have um, a residence at the United Nations, and that's Nazesny's Tree of Life. Um, he is the sculptor for the Akhmatova Project, and Francis Laird, who we'll be talking with a little later, is the director for that project. Um, and we'll be talking with Gordana Lankar, who has just opened a gallery for Russian art in Philadelphia. The other exciting event, along with the United Nations um, in session this weekend, um, was the opening of the Dodge Collection at the Rutgers um, Art Gallery. And in that collection are shown many of the artists which are being featured in two new galleries for Russian art, which have opened in New York City in the last year. And Gordana's gallery, which just opened in Philadelphia, features artists who are in that collection. Mayor Subcheck from St. Petersburg came to um, the opening at Rutgers and made a statement about the artists which are in that collection. I'd like to share it with you because it was very inspiring. He said, people who are shown in this show were untrained in art. They did not have the chance to see masterpieces or photographs, yet the paintings show their honesty, their emotion, their pain, their pride. They painted truth from their souls. These people will never vanish. They will never accept that regime again, which has passed away. He talked a lot about Ru Russia's role in Bosnia um, and Russia's role towards NATO, which we've been hearing about in the United Nations Conference. And he reminded us that the greatness of a country is determined not by its size um, or its population, but by its contribution to civilization. I visited Moscow um, this last spring as a result of an invitation from the Citizens and Ambassador Program, which was begun under um, Eisenhower. and in that capacity saw that Russia is struggling um, to restore its arts and to bring back uh, the heritage which was Russia's at one time. Another program which has sprung up in the country is the American Friends of the Hermitage Museum. It has been helped a lot by the Kimball Museum um, and it has a fundraising uh, farm which is in Manhattan. <coughs> Suzanne Massey and Robert Massey has just brought out a book about the solution to the Anastasia myth um, uh, are in support of that project. And it's very connected to the Akhmatova project in that Akhmatova's home was St. Petersburg, and we'll hear more about that. Also on the Philadelphia scene, Bob Peck, um, who has had many journeys and um, worked with David Attenborough uh, at one point, just came back from looking at the lakes and the ecology there in Mongolia, and is going to be speaking about that at the Natural History Museum on November 15th. So this evening, we're going to go and talk with um, Frances Laird, who directs the Akhmatova Foundation in Philadelphia. 
She's been doing something on that scene which is appearing internationally. In New York this last year, the Russian actress Ella Demidova and the American actresses Marion Saldis and Claire Bloom read poems of Anna Akhmatova along with Pasternak, Mandelstrom, and Sataiva in two performances in New York. In London, um, in the Redgrave Moving Theater series, uh, there was a play called Blue Sail, White Sail about Akhmatova um, and a segment of her life and her translation and her poetry. And in Philadelphia, there have been many benefit readings and much activity in this regard with Francis's um, projects. So I would like to turn to Francis Laird now and hear from her about her project. The Akhmatova Memorial Project is, has been organized to fund and commission a sculpture of the great Russian poet Anna Akhmatova. This sculpture will be executed by Ernst Nyasvyasny, the very well-known Russian um, sculptor whose work we will see. Um, this will be a gift to the people of Russia and it will be placed in St. Petersburg as a gift to the Russian people from lovers of Russian literature um, abroad. Uh, this, you might ask, why commission a sculpture of a poet first. In our country, we don't honor poets the way they should be honored, perhaps. We make our sculptures of military leaders, um, great statesmen. In Russia, there is the, the, the tradition of honoring the great poet with a sculpture. And it's because the poet occupies a very important place traditionally in Russian culture. In the days, even before the communist era, when all information was kept under strict control by the state, even in the centuries before, when the, when the country was ruled by czars and the very powerful Russian Orthodox Church, people were not able to speak out their feelings about their desire for freedom, for instance, and the great problems of humanity. It was the poet's job to do this, and the poet could use his own language to speak the truths of people that couldn't be said out loud. Therefore, um, this is why the poet occupied such an important place in Russian culture. Akhmatova herself was very important in that through the whole beginning of the 20th century. Um, she began, she was born in, eight, in, in 1889, became a young poet in the early pre-war days, pre-First World War, when there was a great cultural ferment in Russia, and indeed in Europe as a whole. She became the first poet who was able to speak of women's experiences. But after she had published two books and become very well known and very celebrated, <coughs> there came the Bolshevik Revolution. And immediately she was silenced because she was considered a decadent relic of the past. Um, so her books were not, were not published. She was not allowed to print her poems. And she was essentially silenced for decades. She never stopped writing poetry, however. Her first husband was killed in 1921 and accused of, a, of being part of a conspiracy, which was not true, but in one of these great roundups and, and mass killings that became uh, such a part of the Russian government's control over their people. Um, she lost her first husband this way. Her son was in prison for years and years. Her third husband died in a concentration camp. And although she couldn't publish her poetry, she kept writing and was able to uh, express the feelings of the Russian people even when they couldn't be expressed out loud. So that is why she has been chosen as, as, the, as the person to who, whom this sculpture will honor. Um, the sculpture will be executed by Ernst Nyasvyasny, who knew Akhmatova and 
in the years before she died, in the early 60s, um, he had the opportunity to make a sculpture of her, which never came about. So now we hope that it will finally come about. And you've brought a photograph of the sculpture with you, haven't you, Francis? Yes, I have brought a, pho a photograph of the sculpture. So perhaps we could see the photograph. This is based on her great poem cycle, Requiem. These were poems that she wrote during the time of the Stalinist terror in the late 30s and early 40s, when people were being uh, imprisoned by the millions. And um, the poems that she wrote at this time about this experience of standing outside the prisons with thousands of other women waiting to hand in packages for her son who was imprisoned there uh, in, in the prison in St. Petersburg. Um, she wrote this series of poems, and it was so dangerous for her, she could not even write the poems down. So the way the poems were preserved were in the memories of her friends. I think we're getting a little bit of the um, tape of the Modigliani drawing, which yes. is done of her. Many, many artists do, drew uh, paintings and drawings of Akhmatova. The one by Medigliani was done when she was a young girl, just had been a new bride, and uh, traveled to Paris on her honeymoon and met Medigliani. And there he did a series of drawings of her. You're using that drawing on your letterhead, aren't you? Yes, we are, because it's a very well-known drawing. A few very spare arcing lines which um, convey the nobility and grace of her person, which she kept for her whole life long. The St. Petersburg um, Preservation Project just came back from a tour to St. Petersburg, and they included this time, along with the uh, Hermitage, a visit to the Akhmatova house mm -hmm. and a visit um, uh, to, in, in light of that, to the Dostoevsky's house and to the literary homes as well as the palace, um, and are aware of the Akhmatova project and included along with um, and its discussions along with the other memorial projects that are taking place in um, St. Petersburg. What about um, your own activities in, in terms of fundraising for the sculpture uh, by the sculptor Nevesny? What, are, what have been some of your projects? Have you had readings like the readings in New York and the, yes, the plays we have. in London? Yes, we, we developed a reading called Waiting for the Muse in which we um, tried to integrate the Russian and English texts in a very new and dynamic way. And these were uh, backed with music, original music, and four of the, the poems were set to music for soprano voice. And it was a very effective and powerful performance. It was. It was very well received in Philadelphia. Um, Thera Jacobson, who's the director of the Fleischer Memorial, is a Russian scholar, um, studies Russian studies uh, background, um, from, from in, and attended the performance and still speaks Russian, as does um, Francis, and she's modestly not told us yet about how she came to this project through translation of Russia, mm -hmm. Russian, and the young woman who has been doing the readings as a PhD candidate at the University of Pennsylvania is now teaching Russian language at UPenn, and um, has just acquired her American citizenship and has this um, family here, um, and including her mother, who have also acquired uh, citizenship, and she, like Akhmatova, is from the Ukraine, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And um, it made a very moving performance. Francis has other plans in the future for other performances. Um, and you acquired the support of administrators here, did you not, in terms of the mayor in yes, Philadelphia? Yes, we have um, letters of support. I really Petersburg. Akhmatova loved Petersburg very much because her whole life was connected with it. And in Russian poetry, there was a particular tradition of Petersburg, not only in the poetry, but also in Russian prose and literature. In fact, we can speak about Pushkin's Petersburg, about the Petersburg of Gogol or Dostoevsky, but among them, there is this honorary place held by the Petersburg of Akhmatova. I have never started. People today are hungering for the transcendent. They didn't know the history. It's my link with my time, with the new life of my people. 
resounded in the heroic history of my country. One bino served on the board that administers all the projects involved and saw events that were unequaled. Going back to the element of poetry, uh, in our country, or in America, poets, which is contrary to European, uh, they are not looked upon very strongly, and uh, as far as poets supporting themselves, there isn't anything to support in this country, as far as poets are concerned. I mean, they can't make a living off of it. There can be some painters that can, some sculptors, uh, architects can, uh, but poets, uh, how do they, you know, it's, it's a very, difficult process and I, I, I think of all the artists, poets are the ones that have the most difficulty in this country. Okay. Uh, in Europe, obviously all of the arts are looked upon very differently because every town has a center or a cultural activity going on, which we do not have, particularly if you take some of the Midwest in this country. Uh, they don't even have real work, they don't even have museums but almost every little town in Europe does, Eastern or Western Europe. And uh, I think that uh, as far as honoring a poet mm -hmm. is number one, very, very un unique in a way, and symbolically is another important thing because sh she symbolizes a particular period of time, being that she was born in 1889 and died in 1966. Uh, and she went to Paris uh, during the, uh, shall we say, uh, one of two major centers. The other was Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, so Paris during the 20s, the teens, and uh, the first decade was quite unique. Uh, it set the tone for the 20th century. And then just across mm -hmm. the Rhine you have Berlin, which was also setting a particular flavor until uh, we had activities coming into the late th 20s and into the 30s. I mean, so. I'll go back to Moscow since 1968. When <clears throat> I visited there again this spring, um, I became intimately aware how natural it is for the Russians to erect a memorial sculpture. When one drives along the major avenues in Moscow, what is clearly evident uh, is how much the Russians love their poets because on every major square there is a memorial sculpture to Pushkin or Gogol or to Gainev or Dostoevsky and the driver was stopping every few moments and he'd stop in front of the sculpture and tell me who it was and what they'd written and when it had been read. Um, and I came back and told Francis, you know, it's very natural when you go to Moscow <laughs> to see a sculptor on every block. But in America we don't see Emily Dickinson and Walt Whitman and memorial sculpture to Maybe our poets. Maybe home, but not, so nothing else. Francis yeah. wittily responded, perhaps <laughs> we should start on Emily Dickinson and, um, and Walt, Walt Whitman, Whitman and a sculpture for them once we've achieved this task. But it is like Im important that the poet is selected and that beyond that, that uh, most of Russia, I think, in a way have a sort of prospered in the arts because of sort of the hardships that they've had, good or bad. Uh, it sort of has germinated many of these kind of uh, perseverances that uh, she is symbolic of. And uh, exactly. just reading the, f the little information that I, I have about her, uh, she didn't learn to sew, she didn't learn to cook. She, uh, so obviously if you're uh, dealing in the 20s and the teens, you're dealing with a time in which there's a lot of things that go on with your clothing if you can't do either, you know, you can't sew it or anything. So well, consequently, your, her place was uh, uh, very strange in that there weren't, uh, she didn't collect anything, uh, basically, and people, uh, they called it a commune. Mm -hmm. she in was other in words, where people came and right. shared and... Uh, she was known for her long shawls, like Isadora Duncan in a similar era was known for her long scarves. Sort of classical <laughs> kind of look. And sort of wrapping herself in these, mm -hmm. these shawls and, and draping herself when she read and when she sat, probably because it's also very cold. <laughs> yes. It's a practical notion. But I think it was a deliberate thing too. She had a child with her first husband, the poet Nikolai Gumilyov, 
and she gave her child to her mother-in-law to raise because I think she had to decide whether she would be an artist or whether she would live the conventional life of a woman then, which sort of ate up all of your time, taking care of everyone, cooking, taking care of a house. And she, she decided that that would not be her life, that her life would be that of a poet, which was a very dangerous and very courageous decision to make because there were no models for her to follow. There, I don't know whether she could even imagine how she would live her life, especially after her husband was killed. And she was essentially on her own um, as a poet, as a... Uh, silenced poet, as a poverty-stricken poet, living at the, in the corners of other people's apartments. That was the way she spent her, most of her life. Um, well, you told an interesting anecdote about how she could not even write her poems, but burned her poems. What? Yes, the poems for Requiem um, were, as I said, preserved in the memories of her friends. She did not dare to write them down. It was so dangerous during the Stalinist terror. Her friend Lydia Chokovskaya would come for tea and they would talk about the weather. And as they, because she knew that there were microphones in her apartment. And as they talked, Akhmatova would, Akhmatova would scribble a poem onto a cigarette paper and hand it to her friend. And her friend would memorize the poem and then they would burn it in an ashtray. And that was the only way her poems were preserved until Stalin died and she was able to write them down on paper. It's a very sober <clears throat> side to Akhmatova's life, but it's softened by this romantic interlude, for example, with Medigliani. Um, mm -hmm. He was inspired by the art of Egypt when he uh, did this drawing. Um, and they used to sit in the Luxembourg Gardens reciting Verlaine. Uh, he didn't speak Russian, but they both spoke French together, uh, which is rather interesting. Um, I think it's a probably appropriate time to go to Gordana. Gordana is Bosnian, by the way, and an American citizen. Oh, she's lived in America for some time. Well, she said she's going to clarify that a little, but <laughs> that's how she introduced herself to me originally. Um, the Akhmatova Memorial Project was approved by the embassy as um, Francis indicated. I'd like to read a little bit from their official letter because I think something that should be on our minds is how do the Russians today respond to a poet whom we wish to honor by the sculpture um, and by the sculptor whom Gordana has at her gallery. Um, and the present counselor for cultural affairs attended her opening, which was just a week or so ago in Philadelphia. He says, the Akhmatova Memorial Project Committee has approached our embassy with the offer of a gift to the Russian people a statue of the Russian poet Anna Akhmatova to be executed by sculptor Ernest Novesny. This gift is to be given on behalf of the lovers of Russian literature abroad. The costs incurred in this project will be covered by funds raised by the Akhmatova Memorial Project Committee. The project is open to any private donations in order to pay for the preparation of a site and future maintenance of the finished sculpture. The Russian Embassy supports this support to honor Anna Akhmatova as one of our great poets and as the symbol of all those citizens of our country who suffered repression as she did. Now let's hear a little bit from Gordana about that opening at which the present counselor attended and uh, was one of the patrons. And she also was present at the opening of the Dodge Collection um, and will tell us how she built her own collection into this successful gallery opening in Philadelphia. Well, I just uh, had my grand opening two weeks ago in uh, Philadelphia on Spruce Street. And my, um, I, I'm a, a, from all the artists that I represent, I've chosen Ernst Nies Wiesny, whose sculpture you can see here, and who is also the sculptor for the uh, Anna Akhmatova monument. Um, my other artist is called Ivano Vajonov, and he came from Moscow. Both artists are present at the opening. and. Uh, opening was uh, under the patronage of the Russian Embassy, and our guest of honor was Igor Golubovsky, who is the uh, cultural attaché of the Russian Federation from Washington, D.C. Um, you mentioned that Ivan is going to be shown in a retrospective or opening show at the new Tetrakov Gallery in yeah, the, Moscow? Mm, um, Ernst Nisvesny is a world famous artist and everybody knew about him and uh, Philadelphia was, I can say, excited about having such a uh, great artist uh, on our in our city in a brand new gallery. 
and Ivan Novozhonov, who is uh, unknown to Philadelphia or United States, is a well-known artist in, in Russia, actually, and he is uh, going to have one-man show in uh, uh, Tretyakov Gallery in Moscow early this spring, I believe, in March. And you found, when you went to the Dodge Collection opening uh, at Rutgers on Saturday night, many artists Oh, uh, yeah. paintings whom you've known and your own visits to Moscow. Oh yes, Dodge Collection represents the nonconformist Russian art from 1956 to 1986. And a lot of those artists are still living in Russia, a lot of them are uh, emigra emigrated to the United States. I represent few of them and, uh, and they were right there at the reception and I had the pleasure to meet them. Like Alexei Sundukov, I'm planning to have one exhibit of his work early this spring and uh, Vladimir Kandelaki. Anatoly um, Rothman, and just to name the few. But there's a, at least 10 artists that I represent who are in the collection of uh, Dodge. Would you tell us a little bit about your story, about how you came to start collecting Russian artists in Moscow? Well, um, yeah, I started as a collector, actually. And um, I was born in Yugoslavia. So um, even though Yugoslavia was a Slavic country, we didn't uh, uh, quite often have the experience of going to United uh, to the Soviet Union of the communism. So when I went first time, all I heard was Iron Curtain and uh, scary stories and like everybody else. And um, I've decided to kind of go behind the curtain and see what is it, what's happening there. And natural for me was art because I was always a collector. And I went to the artist studio, to the galleries that were very limited, only few. And um, when was this? Uh, when was that? Uh, the first time that I went was in uh, 78. Yeah, and I was still living in Yugoslavia at the time. And it was as uh, unusual for me as it would be for you to be in the Soviet Union at the time. But, uh, but I, of course, I was just collecting what I could yeah, afford. Yeah, but when you say you were collecting, uh, somehow there has to be something before that. How did you come? Was it uh, some schooling or was it? Uh, family, your family did it, or how did you come in to collect? You it, met the artist, just, didn't you, and go to no, their Well, it was really... You fell in love no, with and no. some work? <laughs> no, <laughs> no it artist? was natural to me. I always loved art. I could take a lot of things that were not...